brought up in conversation with some regularity. I've talked about it before, but it seems to be a continuing point of confusion for a lot of people. And that is, when you lose weight, what are you doing? Well, you're mobilizing energy from fat cells, right? And energy is stored as, as fat. And when you mobilize that stored energy, when you're losing weight, you're mobilizing triglycerides. Because fat are triglycerides, triglycerides are fat. If you've got a bottle of olive oil, that's a bottle of triglycerides. If you've got a stick of butter, it's a stick of triglycerides. If you've got fat on your pork chop, that's, a, that's fat, that's triglycerides. So fat is made of triglycerides. So when you mobilize fat from fat cells, you're mobilizing triglycerides. And so when you lose weight, there's a flood of triglycerides into the bloodstream. So if you lose just one pound, not much, just one pound, that's 3,500 calories of fat. It's a lot, right? That you're mo If you lose 10 pounds, 35,000 calories of fat being mobilized into the bloodstream. Somebody losing weight rapidly, if you draw the blood out of a vein and spin it down to remove the red blood cells, you have the clear uh, plasma remaining. Uh, and someone losing weight, it can actually look cloudy or milky. That's triglycerides. Uh, so when you lose weight, a natural process, a natural part of weight loss is a rise in triglycerides. So let's say you start at a triglyceride level of just say 90 milligrams per deciliter, right? And you're, you just lost 15 pounds of the past month because you, you uh, um, uh, eliminated wheat, grains, and sugars. You've taken all the steps in my programs that augment insulin responses like vitamin D, magnesium, omega-3 fatty acids, iodine. Uh, and basic efforts to cultivate healthy bowel flora, and you've resensitized yourself to insulin by taking those steps, and you've lost 15 pounds. That's 15 pounds, right, of triglycerides being mobilized into your um, uh, bloodstream. That's what's that? Something like fi almost 50,000 or so calories being mobilized in your bloodstream. Somebody checks your blood, maybe during a routine cholesterol check, and your tri triglycerides went from 90 to 190 or 214 or something like that. And the doctor sometimes not understanding this basic phenomenon uh, because they, t they tend to see weight gain in their patients, right? They don't see weight loss too often. <laughs> and he tries to treat it sometimes and tries to treat it with stupid drugs like statin drugs or fibrate drugs like Lopid, Gemfibrozil, or even some of the really, really dumb drugs like prescription fish oil drugs, right? Those are really stupid. <laughs> Uh, those are ways that big pharma enterprises makes money off duping the public into believing that pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical grade prescription fish oil is somehow superior, which is completely ridiculous. But the doctor tries to treat what is really a transient healthy phenomenon. It's just part of weight loss. Uh, so don't let somebody try to treat or alarm you or they'll say something like this. I told you that program would kill you. <laughs> That's ridiculous. This is part of weight loss. You want to wait a minimum of four weeks after weight loss has plateaued. So let's say over six months you've lost 38 pounds, okay? Give it four weeks and your weight loss, your weight is stabilized. Then you can check some blood and you'll see what the triglyceride level is for real, not from mobilization of fat stores. Now, another thing to know about is HDL, the good. You know, cholesterol panels are largely ridiculous. They have ridiculous pieces of information like total cholesterol, which is completely useless. Cross it out, put a big X through it. LDL cholesterol, a fictitious value that's calculated, and the diet we follow invalidates the calculation. It doesn't mean anything. It's stupid. <laughs> but there are two pieces of information that are useful in a, in a conventional cholesterol panel. Triglycerides, right? Very helpful. And the HDL is helpful. So let's say you start an HDL of 42, which is bad, right? They tell you 42 is okay, right? For a male, 50 is okay. For a female, that's nonsense. You want an HDL of 60 milligrams per deciliter or higher. And by the way, you want triglycerides 60 milligrams per deciliter or less because that's where it tells you those triglycerides no longer contribute to a variety of unhealthy phenomena, including formation of small LDL particles in the bloodstream that cause heart disease, okay? But we're going to aim for a HDL of 60 milligrams per deciliter or higher. It's not uncommon on this program to go from, say, an HDL of 42 to 98 or something like that. I mean, huge increase in HDL. But it takes a long time. And when you lose weight, let's say you start at 42 milligrams per deciliter for an HDL, you lose 38 pounds, say, right? You check that cholesterol panel, HDL dropped maybe to 28 or 
29. The doctor says, oh, that's a high risk if he even pays attention. Uh, it's high risk level. That's from weight loss. The flood of triglycerides causes degradation of HDL particles, and they, they drop transiently. The, the crazy thing about HDL, though, is they will rebound, but it's going to take a year to two years. It's not clear why that HDL is such a slow, uh, it's such a slow process to fully recover and then achieve really good levels. So don't be surprised if you check at the end of weight loss that your HDL has dropped. You check it six months later, it's only partially recovered. Maybe it's 60 or 55. Check another year later, you'll see it's 80 or 90. I mean, extraordinary. Remember, HDL is a, 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 uh, an index of overall health, metabolic health. It can also be a marker for longevity. Isn't that interesting? If you get uh, people who are centenarians, people who live past 100 years old, they almost always have HDLs that are really high, 98, 105, 110, where you're going to have an HDL probably in the 70, 80, 90, or over 100 range. What does that mean? Well, we don't know. Obviously, we have been doing this long enough to, to watch thousands of people live to 110 years old, right? But I speculate that that rise in HDL, such a powerful marker of metabolic health, have we also achieved longevity? I don't know. I think we do, but I don't know. So anyway, bottom line, don't let somebody tell you that the rise in triglycerides during weight loss, what I usually tell people is don't have blood checked during weight loss because the doctor doesn't understand what's going on. We'll often try to treat, try to pass you off on drugs like Lipitor to treat the high triglycerides. So don't fall for that nonsense. <laughs> Somehow this turned into a Rotorite conversation. Okay, we'll buy Rotorite off Amazon. Um, now remember, it's the Gastrus product, G-A-S-T-R-U-S, -S, okay? Because you have to be mindful of strain. Whenever we talk about bacteria, we have to pay attention to strains. My favorite example, E. coli. So you have E. coli, your family has E. coli in their guts, right? But what if you ate romaine lettuce contaminated with cow manure containing E. coli? Well, you can die. You've heard this, right, in the news? Well, same species, right? E. coli, different strain. So strain, you have to pay attention to strain. It can literally be a life-death difference. There are strains of rotary, for instance, that, like the ones we use, thicken your skin, increase dermal collagen, smooth wrinkles, accelerate healing, uh, restore youthful muscle, preserve bone density. Uh, increase libido, turn off appetite, increase empathy for other people, increase interest in other people, uh, and even prevent uh, uh, SIBO. But there are strains of rotary that are that cause inflammation and cause. So you don't want to just get any old strain. Of course, this is a big problem in commercial probiotics. Often they don't even tell you what strains they are. Right, so this is a problem. But our rotary, we want the DSM one seven nine three eight and the PTA 6475 strains. Those are the strains. Now, I have a little secret. I have another strain. I think that works as well, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. <laughs> We're trying to get a clinical trial done to prove that. Uh, we're being delayed by the pandemic. But uh, you want the gastrus, G-A-S-T-R-U-S, from BioGaia, B-I-O-G-A-I-A. -I -A. There's a whole bunch of blog posts, my Wheat Belly blog, right? See, I, I have one post called Making El Rotary Yogurt, a step-by-step -step guide. Shows you how to do it, okay? We're not making yogurt. I call it yogurt because it looks and tastes like yogurt, but it's not yogurt, right? This is a bacterial count amplification process. That's what we're doing here. I don't care what they do in commercial yogurt production because they do it the wrong way. Because it, let's say you're making shoes in a factory, right? Who's going to make more money? The fact that you can make a pair of shoes in 30 minutes or the fact that it makes a pair of shoes in three days? 30 minutes, right? You, for faster production time, right? Well, commercial yogurt manufacturers ferment for four hours. We ferment for 36 hours, okay? So we get far, far greater bacterial counts. Remember the kid's riddle, the kid's little trick question? Which would you rather have, a million dollars or a penny starting on day one that I double every day over 30 days? Kids always say, I'll take the million dollars, right? Well, that penny on day one Two cents, four cents, eight cents, sixteen cents. Seems like you're not going to get much out of that, right? But by day twenty-five to thirty, you've got five and a half million dollars. The same kind of thing, the same kind of phenomenon applies to yogurt fermentation and bacterial count doubling time. The doubling time of rotary is three hours at hundred degrees Fahrenheit, and we don't get a big increase in 
back to accounts until hour 30. Hour 30. So we go to 36 hours. So what do you get when you ferment for four hours? Well, it's like that penny. You're going to get eight cents, <laughs> right? But that's why you don't expect anything when you consume commercial yogurt because there's hardly anything in it. We're doing it differently. And no, you cannot get these kinds of benefits by buying commercial yogurt because one, it's different bacterial species and strains, right? And two, trivial bacterial numbers. So don't be confused by me calling it yogurt. I kind of regret having called it yogurt because it makes people think that they can go buy Faye or Choban and get the same effects, which of course is ridiculous. Okay. All right. Thanks for listening.